Good evening to everyone online and live in Pendleton Hall. Welcome to the first talk in our um, distinguished uh, speaker series. The arc of tonight's talk spans over eight decades. It is about a life that changed its course a number of times, redefining itself in three separate careers. You will find that listening to an octogenarian reflect on his life enables you to see patterns in your own life and to share in what it means to be human. Some of these reflections include the defining role early childhood toys and books can play and who, be, who we become and what we want to be, the power of good ideas, our own and those of others, and the importance of pursuing them. The joy in meeting and working with people from different backgrounds who share a common passion for a subject and want to work on worthwhile projects. And finally, the wonder and beauty of planet Earth. Our speaker, Theodor Pickern, was born in the Netherlands and raised in Bernassen. He graduated from the Academy of the New Church Boys School, then served in the Army, attended one year at Bernassen College, and graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in economics. He and his wife, Kirsten, have four very creative children and five grandchildren. There's much more to say about Theo, but I will now let him, doing the talking, let him do the talking. Please welcome Theodore Pickern. Thank you, and so many friends I see out there, and um, those of you online, a warm welcome. So uh, this is a rather curious title for this presentation tonight, and I really, um, I really uh, need to explain that it was uh, my accountant, Jenny Campbell, that suggested this title. And um, I think that what the title means is, is basically having a positive attitude towards uh, what's next. Now, there may be some members in my family that think uh, that the subject of when I grow up that this should perhaps happen a little faster than it has already. <laughs> so this is the first time in my life that I've ever had the opportunity really to talk about my career and I find it a rather scary subject because um, generally when I'm making public presentations I'm talking about my adventures and I find that um, perhaps a little bit easier. But when I thought about this a little bit more uh, I kind of realized, you know, this is not about me. It's, it's, really, um, it's really about gifts. And uh, the gifts that uh, any, anything of good that I might have done in my life uh, as a catalyst is really a reflection of uh, things that have been given to me. And particularly, it's, a, it's uh, all the gifted people, the, all the creative, gifted people that have surrounded me in every project that I have been involved with. So um, while thinking about this, I was thinking that the word talent is really important. And I recalled back uh, in my youth that a local composer who's in the new church, uh, many of you would knew him, uh, Richard Jarduman, but he mentioned to me, he said, everybody has a talent. And uh, it's really important to discover what that talent is because uh, that's what's been given to you. And when you think about... Um, being, discovering your talents and um, 
and developing me and uh, and then ultimately giving back to the Lord and thanking him for giving me that particular role. What uh, really um, fascinates me is that um, a talent is not something that is just transitory. It's something because uh, those of us that have been exposed to the teachings of the new church know that the spiritual world is a kingdom of uses. And uh, while the Lord, through life and our spiritual journey, asks us to give up our selfishness in all the things that look to self, um, the reality is that heaven is a kingdom of uses. And I think that the concept of talent related to use is a very strong one. And, of course, we have that wonderful parable of Matthew, which I think fits right into that. So the other thing uh, that has been very much, and Martha alluded to this a little bit in the introduction, is uh, the interweaving of things like... Um, like family and all the things that are really very early in our life that kind of form who we are or who we be, who we can become. So <coughs> I'm getting to start with my grandfather who's up on the screen and thinking of the stunning changes that have occurred just since grandfather John was alive. Think of it. We can see his Horse carriages on 2nd Street Pike. Uh, unlike those of us who benefited from going through high school here and college and university, he left school when he was only 14 years old. And yet, um, through perseverance, uh, working first in the telegraph office at 14, uh, in his 20s, uh, taking care of Abraham Lincoln on one of his critical trips when there were assassination trip, uh, attempts on him to ultimately uh, building uh, one of the largest uh, companies in America, Pittsburgh Clay Glass, but always, even having left the school, always being a student, uh, and even when he was 70, actually studying Latin. So... Uh, these stories about my grandfather that my father uh, related to me have always um, been um, uh, very fascinating, um, very fascinating challenges. Because you know, when you have a when you have someone like that uh, in the family, um, it raises the bar pretty high. And as far as raising the bar, you know, if you I see Carly Osborne out there. He knows my my high school grades, and he's tracked me all the way through high school. So if you saw my grades between um, elementary and high school, you wouldn't think I'd be up here standing and talking to you tonight. So that's my grandfather. Um, when you think about my grandfather, basically horses and trains were getting around. Uh, an idea of the universe uh, being basically the Milky Way. The Milky Way is not a small place with a hundred billion stars and countless planets. But when you think today that there's actually probably a hundred billion galaxies with a hundred billion stars, what a stunning change just in such a short time. My grandfather had three sons, a loss of a daughter to appendicitis, which is a sad story, and of course also his wife, but three sons who formed a holding company from his assets, a personal holding company. And so I am from my grandfather, third generation, and you can't imagine what it might be to be born in, well, 
actually I was born in Holland, and it occurs to me that actually I could have been born aboard a ship because I was just about two weeks out of the boat when I was born in Holland, in a little um, seashore town um, in Holland. Um, but when you were in a small community which was trying to protect its identity from its origins, we're celebrating our 100th anniversary here at the borough this year. Um, it was, one could probably say, somewhat inward-looking, uh, inward-looking perhaps to protect its identity. But um, that little community, of course, uh, you were kind of defined by who you were in the community, and the most frequently asked question was, who is your father? So when I was probably three or four years old, and I was in France with my family, one of the last times that I was in Europe before World War II came along, they gave me a wonderful gift. They gave me a little whale. I think it was a humpback whale, actually. And this little whale, you could wind up. It actually floated in a swimming pool, and it made its spout. And I love that whale. But um, to my chagrin, when the trunks were packed up and we came back from France and the trunks were unpacked, my whale was not there. And it was months and months before I forgave my parents for leaving my whale at home. I even asked them to ship it. And um, thinking about that, uh, the things that happen to you in late time are not, in our belief, accidents. Um, and uh, to think that I was, during my lifetime, uh, privileged to to have the most intimate experience with uh, four of the largest whale species in the world. Uh, I find that uh, truly amazing. This picture uh, that you see now on the screen is me when I got into my first uh, free swimming in the ocean. And uh, that was up in Cape Cod and then Tucket Sound and um, I was really enamored by the ocean, went out, got a mask. Someone gave me a beautiful picture of, a, a beautiful book of marine creatures, mainly fishes. They were paintings, not photographs. And I treasured this book, and uh, I would show them to adults. And I'd show them this beautiful fish, and. Uh, the adults say, would say, is it good eating? <laughs> this is not where I was coming from. <laughs> so there are so many things that inspire you along the way. Um, and adventure is very much stirred into um, my life. And some of those early people that inspired me about adventure was this uh, gal you see actually on a zebra in Africa, Osa Johnson. And you probably have seen those wonderful dioramas that are in the, Met in the Natural History Museum in New York and other places. And um, Osa, who wrote this book, I Married Adventure, was a, a lovely book, and uh, what what I found so exciting was that there were actually places in the world which were really truly wild, where uh, you know you could see nature at work. Uh, being uh, kind of slow to get into reading, I eventually uh, someone put me on to the tales of Henry Ware. He was a Kentucky frontiersman when Kentucky was largely a forest, and uh, he was 
interfacing with the American Indians in this big forest and learning their ways. And um, this was so inspirational to me that actually I not only read that book, but I went back to the library and, uh, and I think I got every volume on the series and read it. So, 1951, I finally got the opportunity to do something really wonderful. First thing that is that my brother uh, built a dark room, and I'm not very good at building dark rooms. And um, the other good thing I really appreciated uh, this about my brother is he, he lost interest in the dark room pretty, pretty quickly. So uh, it was mine to move in. And uh, never thinking small, I went to Africa uh, to stay with the Philip Odener uh, family. I see one of them back here, Jerry, uh, in 1951. And I took a 4 by 5 speed graphic and uh, a development tank and uh, film plates. I don't know if 4 by 5 that's a large format camera, and these were the first images I ever made in a dark room. Of course, I also did the, they, they hooked me into doing the senior yearbook. But getting, but it gave me the opportunity to photograph the principals, you know, and I wasn't always on good terms with him. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Gladys, a wonderful man. So um, getting to Africa uh, was a real eye-opener for me because this was the first time that I started to get an inkling as to what an ecosystem is. You know, we don't, I didn't understand what an ecosystem was just from being, watching birds in the backyard. But when I got to Africa, and I saw a wild landscape, and I saw the animals, and better still when I returned back in 59 and walked on rhino trails with Ian Player, who is the brother of that famous golf player that you guys probably remember, Gary Player. But he took us on a wilderness trip on, where we just walked on rhino trails. And when he started to explain the interrelationships in nature, how everything worked together, I found that absolutely astounding. Uh, having my speed graphic, having a plate camera, having my development tank, of course, I had to change the film plates in these game reserves. And I was always hoping that they would remember that I was under the blanket in the trunk of the car and that they would let me out. And here I am uh, on this wonderful trip with Ian Player, and there are rhinos there. And um, so um, I was taking care behind this tree. And as they came closer, I discovered that even though a tree might, ha might be a thorn tree and have a lot of thorns, you're not thinking about thorns when you jump in that tree. So, I've described Bernathan, a small community, which kind of defines who you are from who your father is or who people think you are. So, when I finally, um, at r right after high school, my parents were in Europe. Mrs. Emily Osborne had a wonderful party for us veterans the night I went in. And on my 19th birthday, I was on a bus to Fort Meade, Maryland. And this was uh, a great discovery because it gave me an opportunity to learn who I was. And who I was was US 5233366. And and I had a I had a uniform actually that looked like everybody else. Actually, it didn't look like everybody else because originally they couldn't even fit me. So I was, working, I was walking around with, with fatigues on while everybody else had their beautiful ODs on, and some guy pulled me in to do the furnace. And that's how I started my Army career. 
Uh, so they asked me w uh, at Fort Meade, the uh, initial question was, um, well, we got two uh, places you can go. You can be a medic or you can be a tanker. And I was absolutely sure I was not a medic because the sight of blood scares me to death. And having tooled around with Carly, you know, during my high school years, I said, I love cars. And they said, you're a tanker. <laughs> so that's, that's me out there in Mojave Desert with a, with a tank shell and trying to learn who I was and living in a barrack with 40 other guys for two years, just towards the end of the Korean War. And then uh, got back to Burnett Hill College, and actually my grades actually were almost respectable that first year in Burnett Hill College, and they were wonderfully transferable to uh, the University of Pennsylvania. But I still had the problem of being a little bit of a slow reader, and I was really nervous when they gave me that comprehension test about uh, how my reading comprehension was. But the Lord smiled on me, and guess what that test was on? It was on photography. <laughs> and I aced it. So they didn't pick me up. And then, of course, uh, 59, wonderful uh, marriage. Um, I, wasn't, I didn't want to get married until I was through with Penn, but my father and my father-in-law were both ministers, so... Uh, they all said and informed us that there was a minister's meeting coming up in June and that I couldn't get married in September, so you guys got to get married in June. Okay, we did. And then we had the opportunity to, to build this wonderful house that was designed by this mid-modern architect, Richard, Nick, Richard Neutra who in many ways was uh, a figure comparable to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And um, he was a remarkable man, actually, in his 70s at the time uh, that I got to know him. Uh, I thought 70s was a rather fragile age to be holding someone by the arm, you know, taking him around the quarry when we had no driveway up in our place, but we had met him at our apartment in Philadelphia, and he said, well, there's a full moon tonight, isn't there? So we actually went up to the site and savored it for the first time in the full moon. But Richard Neutra uh, filled in for me uh, a lot of um, things that were really formative for me in terms of uh, where I was heading, uh, in, in terms of uh, things that I could contribute to. And um, one of the things that um, Neutra was so much in tune with was the importance of, uh, of, of building structures that relate to nature and uh, regarding the human not only for his spirituality but also his biology that, you know, that noise, Space, all the things that we can think of, and the extensions of the architecture into nature. All these things are really um, important to our well being. And so often, you know, in the way we developed the country, we didn't think about this. But he did. And uh, like this book here, Nature Near. Um, it had a, a, a very profound effect on me. And of course, it was such an innovative uh, type of architecture that this uh, picture of him on Time Magazine, what will the neighbors think? Uh, that was really a very good question at that time. So this was his first sketch of our house, and um, there's the great man, a very neurotic individual who could when he stayed with us over a weekend, he would just totally wear us out on his energy. And Kirsten and I would just kind of have to recover after he left. Uh, the neighbors across the way were quite concerned about 
you know, are those woodland tracts being developed and what, what's going to happen next? Um, but the interesting thing is that while they lived in a traditional village, we called the per Pearson Village with houses that were early American, dating back to the 1700s. When they saw this and they saw the, ha the way the house integrated onto the site, they were delighted. So this is my privileged uh, life to live in this, to live with nature through all its seasons for over 50 years. I had a step-grandfather who was a painter, and uh, so I was very much into the world of painting. And of course, my father, besides being a minister and giving me very formative values that are probably my greatest treasures, he was also a collector. So this painting happens to be um, uh, Santa Dress um, by Monet. And um, my father empowered me to sell this painting. Um, it, um, my father was quite a strong-minded person. Um, and I, I, I'm going to share this story with you, which is a little bit um, risky because the folks at the Metropolitan Museum of New York who bought this painting, it was the first painting to break a million dollars, the first impressionist. They might be a little worried when I reveal this story, but I'm going to take the risk since so many years have passed on the test telling it. But at any rate, I was dealing with a, with a gentleman at, at Christie's from London by the name of David Bathurst, and David Bathurst says to me, um, it's very important that this painting not be touched before it goes to the London market, because in the London market, they like to discover their painting. So one month before this painting is supposed to be heading to London, my dad says, have you seen the Monet? And I said, well, I've seen the Monet all my life. What, what, what's the deal? He said, well, it's been cleaned. I said, it's been cleaned. I said, well, who cleaned it? He says, well, I cleaned it myself. I said, how did you do that? He said, well, I got a um, bucket of water, some toilet paper, and um, I said, Dad, do you know you might have taken $100,000 off that painting? He said, no, go take a look at it. Well, I took a look at it. It did look beautiful. And uh, so I got to go to London, and I was at Pitcairn by that time, having left the bank where um, I had the most horrible formative experience with my first job in commercial credit and then ultimately getting into something that was kind of fun at the bank, which was uh, a new provision under the EDGE Act Corporation where you could do some fun and a little bit risky things with the bank, which suited my personality really well. And, um, and then Dad empowered me to do this, and that by that time I was at Pitkin's company. Um, they had... Uh, finally thought I was okay to join the company. Um, so maybe uh, I was a little full of my self-importance and uh, thinking that I was more important at the company than I really was. Uh, so I arranged to take uh, Dirk Youngie's helicopter to Kennedy Airport. 20 minutes later, I was on the Concorde going to London and we got there in the evening, we checked in the hotel, said, please wake us up at 8 o'clock in the morning for the sale of the Monet. And guess what? They didn't wake us up. <laughs> <laughs> but the painting sold. And Dad, being the, the adventurer that he was, was also very early to recognize the merit of other painters, Van Gogh or Van Hoek, as we call them in Dutch, uh, was not famous or well-known at all, and uh, Dad thought 
got some of his paintings actually from Theo Van Gogh's um, widow. And uh, I also had the privilege of negotiating the sale on those two. Well, one of the interesting things, and I know that all of you in this room have in one way had this experience, uh, is your relationship with your parents, and especially uh, uh, my relationship with my father, who I had a ton of respect for, but in truth, he was a rather strong-willed person himself and had some different ideas of what I should be doing than perhaps I was thinking for myself because I had already been into nature and uh, I was loving um, the idea maybe that my sisters were putting into my head that maybe I should maybe I should be a uh, be working for National Geo and doing wonderful things in Africa but my father thought I should be going to the London School of Economics and going to the family company. So guess who won out? It was a time when we really did listen to our dads, and as I mentioned, I was in the bank for a short time, uh, ending up with some that was something that was a little fun, five years at the bank, and then uh, having the opportunity really uh, to get a little bit of investment background before I joined the company. So I, I actually got to go into a working department and had the fun really of putting together the first uh, iteration of the new church investment fund. And that was fun too because it was bringing together a lot of uh, different new church institutions and by bringing them together and uh, managing them as a single entity, um, achieving much better results. But the other side of my love, of course, which I've already spoken to, was nature. And um, I had, so after uh, some years of in the investment department at the company, I had the opportunity with the support of the family, really to look at very extensive properties that were held not only by the Pitcairn Company, different members of the family, uh, trust, um, but uh, a much bigger group, which I'll just touch on in a minute. Um, there were some things along the way, again, additional things that were strong inspirations to me and um, one thing that uh, amazed, continues to amaze me is how often one individual, just one individual in a world that is now over seven billion people, how, what a huge difference just one person can make. And of course, Rachel Carson was one of those. And she was, and through her book, and of course she was a marine biologist too, she, uh, she really changed the world and she became really the beginning of the environmental movement. And then there was that stunning picture with the Apollo program where the first time in our lives we saw an earth rise from the moon. And if we didn't get the message then of what the world is in a more holistic sense, then I would start to wonder, when will we get it? And particularly today, it doesn't seem to be a good time to be reverting back to tribalism and nationalism. And of course, the bigger picture is it's really an ocean planet. And um, being an ocean planet, it's, um, it is um, the ocean, really, which is probably the most dominant influence in terms of our future. And yet, many of the public that just goes down to the shore and sees the glassy surface and doesn't see what's happening underneath, their, their sight of the ocean, even though they have the love, is is rather superficial. So I was 
saying that now I had an opportunity for Pitcher and Company to do something new, and that was to look at the land holdings and the and the uh, opportunity to really start to think about 1,600 acres in the in the study area where very soon in the future this whole opportunity to do planning would break up because this land would have ended up going in many, many different directions. But with the support of the family and the support of the Penny Pack Trust, which is now known as the Penny Pack Trust, uh, uh, I was given the opportunity to do some really serious planning. Uh, originally, the Penny Pack was a watershed association, and uh, we were thinking about such things as, uh, as uh, what was polluting the creeks and uh, what was creating the flooding. And there were no steep slope ordinances in, in the various municipalities that constituted the 56 square mile um, watershed, uh, and there was no floodplain ordinances. So. Our, our, with this plan that finally came out in 1975, we developed the idea of a, of a central corridor that would be a wilderness, what we called a wilderness park at the time. And we envisioned it as being something that would be 800 acres. And then we were also concerned about what would happen in the periphery because what happens in the periphery would happen, would affect the preserve. And finally, um, the sewer plan, which doesn't sound very much related to nature, but really is because there was a plan for an interceptor plan that would take all of the water out of the creek uh, and treat it in the Delaware. And at that time, so we, so we came up with an alternative proposal to try to keep the water in the watershed by recycling it. But the idea that sewage or water is a recyclable resource was not completely in the minds of people at that time. And they didn't know what happens on the International Space Station where, you know, they're actually drinking what they're doing. So it, it, it's worked, and that's the way the world has actually worked as a natural system for a long, long time. However, well, and this was absolutely what I view as one of my failures because uh, innovative funding was available for, for innovative treatment at the time, but, and we had the support of the Environmental Protection Agency and the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Resources, but the hard lesson to be learned was we didn't have the local support of some of the local communities. And in effect, we were the tail wagging the dog. And what I learned through seven years of, of hard effort was that doesn't work too well. So um, as my father started to step out of my life, uh, two weeks before he passed away, he called me in. He told me that I was spending too much time on the penny pack and not enough time at pit game. And he then said, I won't be around at Christmas time. And in fact, he was not, well, in a decade, I became chairman of the company. So I think he would have been happy with that. Um, one of the things that I got to work on as chairman, and I say this just as a general, a general uh, comment, was uh, I knew that we had to go and do, uh, uh, redo and develop a mission statement and principles, but I didn't, I underappreciated how important that really is for organizations to to develop uh, a statement. I, I thought of it more as a job, but by the time I was through, I saw the power of doing that. Now I'm reverting back to this latent love of mine, which uh, my sister said I should be doing, which is 
actually discovering my real talent, which I think is uh, photography. And the people that inspired me, um, and um, one of those was Elliot Porter. Uh, and Elliot Porter's um, compositions of nature were so strong and so disciplined. And uh, like Ansel Adams, he had the discipline, he, he had a wonderful technical knowledge of how to achieve the most beautiful results. So he went to extremes. He understood that long exposures were what he needed but with the characteristics of color film at that time, color would actually shift from long exposures. And he knew what filters to use to compensate for that shift that would occur in film. There was another man, and this book, In Wildness is the Preservation of the World, so, expi so inspired me uh, with the quotations from Thoreau. But shortly after seeing this book, I also read this article by uh, this interview with Pablo Pasol, Pasol, the cellist. And this was an article that moved me beyond belief. Do not waste your life with things you do not feel. Of course, he had a passion for Johannes, Johann Sebastian Bach, which which is really constituted in many ways as fine in my life. But this thought was a very compelling thought, and um, he actually described retirement as the first step into death. And then Ansel Adams. Ansel, also a wonderful artist and also uh, an amazing um, technician who developed the zone system, who understood um, the concept of pre-visualization, that you could actually visualize uh, in the field and think about what you needed to do to achieve the final result in the dark room. And of course, Jacques, with my ocean love, Jacques Cousteau. So in the early 70s, I um, actually, my brother-in-law talked me into getting a scuba tank. We had no instruction in the Cayman Islands and, and went for it, but uh, that was the beginning of um, the idea that, you know, maybe I can do something with this stuff. And I got a Hasselblad camera. Uh, I actually had a borrowed one from a dealer and. New Orleans, which I almost lost when, um, when they couldn't find me after about my third dive in the, in the Cayman Islands, but they managed to spot me about um, 15 minutes later on my way to floating out to Cuba. So there's the camera. It was a medium format camera. And uh, I started going on really exotic trips all around the world with a dive firm out in in San Francisco called CNC that was uh, doing liveaboard trips. This is an outing to Hawaii where um, we saw spinner dolphins jumping out of the water and uh, all of a sudden we realized the spinner dolphins were there because of this whale shark and it took me about two minutes to break free uh, far enough from that whale shark to get a picture. And then, uh, finally, after uh, some visits to the Galapagos Island, uh, my first opportunity to do an exhibit, uh, actually number one of three exhibits uh, at Smithsonian. And I incorporated as a sidebar activity during the 70s. And um, so um, we did this exhibit. Um, and. Um, of course, Galapagos is one of those amazing places where you 
really understand not only ecosystems, the relationship between the land and the ocean, but um, also the, the understanding of how Darwin uh, came to understand really what evolution was. Now, I know that evolution was a little bit of a controversial subject in this community, but uh, the way that Pearson, who had a science background, and I saw it was that it was part of the Lord's order, and she actually got permission to teach evolution in the elementary school when uh, Barbara Sinsett was around. And I remember Pearson describing the day when the when the girls in the class stood up and started uh, clapping when she when she when she mentioned, and then the Lord provided a a soul for what was now truly human. So these are some images taken with the passive lead from my Galapagos days. with Pearson, of course, was a wonderful new opportunity for us. Uh, I remember actually a little story about Jimmy Carter and Rosalind uh, working on a book together, and um, I think at the end of that story they were only communicating with each other by email, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it worked uh, better for us, but there is some, certainly some accommodation that has to be made. So Kirsten not only did the text for the Galapagos exhibit that we did, but then we tried to get a book published. And uh, I was still working for Pitcairn, and I would say to my secretary, if a publisher has a response to our overture to do a book, uh, please put the letter upside down uh, and... Um, bring me my copy, and uh, so after I had my copy, I would peel up the upside-down letter and read the last paragraph and just say, thank you for sharing with us, and good luck for the future. So um, it takes a lot of uh, perseverance and, and, and uh, courage to go forward with the idea of a book, but we were very lucky because uh, we got a, recep a good reception from Little Brown and the New York Graphic Society. And I don't know exactly how this actually happened because they were just at the time publishing uh, books by well-known photographers to be, so to be imported into that crowd uh, was um, a great privilege. And uh, Hidden Seascape actually um, was marketed by Little Brown. We had no uh, no influence over what they priced it. They priced it at $70 back in the early 80s, which if I think you translate that into current dollars, you're probably talking about $163. So that's pretty pricey. But it was um, a really wonderful project. And there was something about underwater seascapes that I could see a kind of a correlation between the seascapes and the idea of ecosystems uh, and the terrestrial environment. And of course, the great thing about uh, underwater uh, photography is that you're weightless. So that you can go up or down and it's kind of like um, having um, uh, Prince Trigio's magic carpet. This picture is memorable because we, uh, I went with our marine biologist to Mexico, to Baja, and at the end of a long day in a little fishing village where we took all our equipment, a little VW, VW um, a young uh, member of the fisherman's family took us out uh, to get this uh, image at Las Trelles late in the afternoon. And as we were charging back, he... Uh, he ran the skiff up on the beach uh, uh, at quite a high speed, and, and the skiff kind of stopped like it had brakes on it as it hit the sand, and 
and our equipment flew, and we flew, and somehow, amazingly, uh, nothing was destroyed. All kinds of different environments. But one thing that always fascinated me about the ocean is that how distinctive these ecosystems are, you know, depending where you I could actually go into my library and say, well, this was, this was taken in the Red Sea, you know, just because of the characteristics of the ecosystem. And we've lost a lot of that with our terrestrial environment. Pelia and anemones in British Columbia. And, and then uh, also uh, getting back to uh, some landscape photography as well actually got accidentally locked into Machu Picchu, uh, uh, which was an interesting experience because I thought I might have to spend a night there, but you'll notice there's no tourists there, and I'm very doubtful if you'll ever see another photograph of, of Machu Picchu which has no tourists in it. So I read an article towards the end of my pitch-sharing experience about in the Wall Street Journal that suggested the idea of changing careers between 55 and 60. And I thought, you know, this is kind of an interesting idea. And uh, of course, I had been working for 150 shareholders at Pitcairn, and um, the family at that time was five generations and a little restive. and. Um, I saw some, um, some opportunity for maybe instead of working for 150 people, working for myself and perhaps doing some new things that were more correlated to my basic love. So I made a great effort to get off everything I was involved with, which happened to be between the charitable and the planning commissions and the various things, about 13 different boards. Clear the deck. And in, instead of thinking of continuing with photography, I thought that I could reach out further uh, with filmmaking that maybe I would be able to reach a, a wider audience. So after 20 years with, as, uh, with the Penny Pack, very smart thing as a being one of the founders, and there's an old saying, I thought founders tend to founder. I thought it was a good time, good time to, to get off and, and do something else. So again, working with Kirsten, we decided that we would work on a film uh, in a very exotic place in Micronesia called Yap, which was called The Mantas of Yap. And I thought we were really going to get something, this, this film launched. NHK in Japan was giving us a lot of encouragement. But then all of a sudden, about a month later or two months later, my contact with NHK completely disappeared. And I couldn't get her by phone call. Nothing worked. And of course, what happened is they picked up the idea and ran with it themselves. And then uh, thunderstruck in Yap, I was um, out on a boat, and I had a ship to shore radio message that said, um, you have been elected chairman of the County Planning Commission. What? And so I was really, I was really torn by that because I thought I had clear, cleared the desk. But on the other hand, I saw the opportunity uh, to do some more things at the county. And the way, uh, you know, with my life that nature had instructed me, um, perhaps bring a new perspective to the planning commission. And again tremendously indebted to one person. Uh, his name is actually Russ Pelling. He said, Thea, why don't, you, um, why don't you do something about open space in the county? Uh, and curiously enough, uh, the county planning commission was quite supportive of this idea. Uh, the, the, the commissioners were not being good Republican commissioners. They weren't going to spend any money on open space. But 
the interesting thing is that they learned that it would be it was actually possible. And Art Lobin, who was executive director of the County Planning Commission for 35 years, a wonderful friend of mine, conceived this really ingenious plan to have a blue ribbon group that would be in business exactly for six months, make recommendations, be out of business. And uh, they wanted me to be the chairman of this group, but and the county commissioners resisted this idea, but something much better happened. They made the two parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, got together and they made them co-chairmen. So within two years, this miracle happened before I left the Planning Commission for good. And uh, the county put up $100 million for open space acquisition. But it was good to leave and concentrate my full efforts on filmmaking. And so we actually hired a man, uh, Mose Richards, who had actually worked for Jacques Cousteau and knew the Cousteaus well, and he was kind of saddled with the, uh, with the uh, requirements for the Cousteaus of making stories out of this film that they were bringing back from the ocean. And that was a good lesson for me, too, because I found out that they, d they weren't so enamored by my compositional skills, but filmmaking was all about stories, stories stories, to try to get that into my head. Uh, and so um, the more we got into um, filmmaking um, in all these wonderful different uh, treasured ecosystems around the world, um, we tried more and more to think about the story. But needless to say, it's not Hollywood down there. So. And here I am from my childhood dreams, uh, thinking about uh, my little whale when I was just knee high to a grasshopper, um, actually getting to do a production on sperm whales, the largest tooth mammal in the world. And I had been trying, uh, all through my youth, I'd been tracking what was known about sperm whales. And of course, we know from uh, these, these whaling days that sometimes they even sank ships uh, 200 tons. And that book on the tragedy of the, Essex, of the Essex actually two, two boats of 200 ton weight were actually rammed by, by male uh, sperm whales. So, and just before I started this uh, crazy trip to the Azores, with 22 pieces of luggage and, and nobody to help me, which is probably the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, I heard a story about some Japanese guy that actually didn't come back to the surface uh, with sperm whales. So it was quite a heartbeat time the first time uh, one came towards me. And um, Ultimately, getting in with a socializing group was, was just um, an incredible experience. Finally, uh, of course, the NHK didn't work out, but we did do uh, our first uh, success was with ITEL in London, where we did a seven-half-hour series. And then later, with PBS, uh, a five-hour series that was shown widely on PBS and ultimately also picked up by National Geo and, and shown widely internationally. And you know, again, um, the thing that um, occurs to me about doing these things is that as a filmmaker, the way you portray nature is really um, very much in the mind of the filmmaker. And uh, I am uh, really, saddened by some of the things that a blue ribbon group like National Geo is doing nowadays where they portray nature in an ugly kind of way uh, with claws and fangs and undoubtedly that's related to uh, 
to the market and to the money, but I always felt, I always resisted that idea of portraying the ocean in this way. So we kind of had the opportunity to create the Ocean Wild series as my journal in a way that uh, didn't do that, but more was to appeal to the heart of uh, the observer and make them realize what's underneath this ocean that's worth protecting. And uh, because once you engage the heart, then you can engage the mind with uh, some sound conservation matters. And then ultimately, of course, it was wonderful that our work uh, even got out to uh, international markets. And, um, and so this ended up being a very rewarding career for us. And I say us because uh, it was so much of a team effort and um, nothing would have ever happened that was beautiful without these teams. Ingrid Herter out here is still on board. She's still putting up with me. And Christine McDonald sitting next to her, she, uh, she's a key player on our latest exhibit on Iceland. And many other people in the community that I've had the uh, pr privilege to work with. Um, I guess I've always been open to new ideas and uh, I'm kind of a, an early adapter. And uh, when I did get into filmmaking, I kind of, the whole industry was still doing film. But when I looked at the broadcast cameras that existed, uh, I decided that actually they were maybe even better underwater than the than film was because they would reveal the spectrum of colors that, that existed down there. So um, this picture of me actually is out in uh, blind in Vancouver Island where we got special permission to go to a, um, a beach where the killer whales frequented where they would rub on the rocks. It took us two years to get that permission and we developed some special equipment. Here I could, they insisted that we be in a blind. So here I am in a blind with a special uh, custom piece of equipment where the camera could be in the water, in the stones underwater and uh, I could operate all the controls in the blind, the panning and everything else that a camera does. And again, as I mentioned, the teamwork, the wonderful lasting friendships that I have made over a lifetime are amazing. Here you see the blind uh, from the outside. And the, again, the equipment. Uh, a special pole cam that we developed. We got wonderful cooperation from Sony who um, even provided me with some equipment that they hadn't even brought to market yet to, to field test. So, and then of course, being an early adapter, even though, even while BBC was doing Blue Planet, we were already in the high definition and using high definition cameras. I said, why are you guys using HD? And of course, learning that hard lesson in Rochester, a sorry town, the Kodak, so successful with film, such a wonderful company and yet not learning the lesson that things transition on. And even though they had some of the basic patents for the new technology, they didn't see it coming and uh, they missed the boat. Of course, being out in the field uh, 90 days a year um, does have some issues for your family. And um, so, being a good father or being a great good grandfather was always a challenge. And then finally, perhaps the most amazing experience in my whole film career was Ocean Voyages, where I think something happened that probably has never happened before. Uh, and I say that very carefully, uh, but somehow, Bob Cranston, who my friend who just died at 
brain cancer, unfortunately, but he and I went out to Tahiti. And the amazing thing is that we found a mother humpback and a calf in these clear waters off of Ulutu Island in Tahiti, where we were actually able to befriend a mother and a calf for two weeks and incrementally get into their trust every day. They would spread, spread their mother would spread out her big 15-foot pectoral fins, flippers. We would respect that as body language. We're close enough. The next day, we could get closer. By the end of the second week, we actually got film intimate pictures of the calf nursing from the mother, seeing the tongue come up in high definition and wrap around the mammary gland. The first time anybody, as far as I know in the world, has ever seen this, so that the scientists were able to actually write it up and, and see what happened. And then being blessed with uh, Meryl Streep, uh, who, without charging us a penny, spending four hours in New York after she came in a taxi cab and, uh, and doing a narration, just because she believed in the project. Here are some images of our two weeks stay with the mother and calf. The calf was very boisterous, and we had to be careful because he was kind of viewing us as a ball. And, and um, so we had to back up, but he was getting better and better at his game, and I lost uh, my attention span perhaps in thinking about this and he whacked me pretty hard at 50 feet and I was really after knocking my mask off and shoving this 100 pound uh, underwater housing into my ribs I was pretty lucky to get back to the surface but for the calf it was all a game but amazing to be with an animal like this that you're really communicating with over and, and develop a trust relationship. And then finally, the really biggest project that we had in this film career, which, which was the second exhibit at Smithsonian, the Ocean Hall, a $90 million ocean hall, classical ocean hall that was being restored. And I had heard about this from my entertainment lawyer about four years before, he, um, and he um, made me aware of the opportunity, but four years passed and I didn't think anything about it, but suddenly I'm, I'm invited in and um, to, um, to be part of the Ocean Hall. But at the time they had already signed a very onerous contract with a, with a contractor that had the whole hole. So we were going to be subcontractors to, to this major contractor. And we met, uh, Laura Orthwine and I met uh, one dismal day there with their contractors. I think there were 11 guys sitting around the table. And they made it very, very clear to us that it, they didn't want us on the project. And the other thing that became clear to me was that uh, we weren't going to be able to do the quality that we had envisioned. But um, a lovely thing happened. A month later, I got a nice personal letter from the director of the museum saying, we really want you. And so instead of being under the contractor, we, re we negotiated a contract where we could be independent of them in the ocean hall, and that was... Uh, Quite an amazing project. Uh, equipment alone, 12 projectors in the ceiling, a uh, million and a half dollars for equipment, a uh, million and a half dollars for the content that we provided with the, from these screens 40 feet wide. And um, it was a great way to wrap up the film career. But I did continue to do outreach. Uh, with what I had learned about the ocean, um, 
you know, back when I start, I've seen the ocean reefs, 50% of the ocean reefs that I have known around the world are gone or seriously damaged. When I was uh, a member of Ocean Conservancy in the 90s, acid ocean was not even on the radar screen. Today, it's huge on the, uh, on, on the radar screen, and the oyster catchers out on the West Coast in Washington State see what's happened as a, already from acidification. It's a huge issue, and it's, re and it's, and it's related to, to what's happening in the climate and climate change. But so I took the opportunity whenever I could to, to make presentations. Um, here was a great opportunity in West Virginia where I got to address 1,000 students. Um, I think it was like about four or five different school districts. Sometimes I got interesting questions. I think uh, one girl asked me uh, how uh, sperm whales got their name, and I said, well, I don't think it's what you're thinking. <laughs> but the good thing is that at the end of that, uh, two of the teachers said we have two students that want to become marine biologists. And of course, also the opportunity to show our films in places of conservation like the reception room here in Washington of Ocean Conservancy. And then, of course, the final thing was, as I'm transitioning it to another career, I'm thinking, what are we going to do with our film library? Because, in a way, our film library has things that don't even exist anymore. It's kind of like having dinosaur. A very sad comment that that would happen, and that I just happened to be in the water during the three or four months underwater in the ocean during the golden days of the ocean and diving, but our library is now in New Zealand with NHK. We're sharing in revenues from the stock sales, but even better, uh, they have uh, curated my library and um, they're also offering it to young people uh, for low-grade YouTube so that they can um, tell their own stories about the ocean. Always for me, though, it was coming back, and there was something captivating and compelling to me about the still image. So I returned back to the... Going too far over time. Uh, I returned back to the, um, to the still, Im still, uh, still image, which... Um, and had the opportunity to tell the penny pack story, which at that point, the dream had really been fulfilled uh, several years ago. The penny pack went over its 800 acre dream, which was formulated in 1975. And I embarked seriously by getting a digital Hasselblad the one I now own has 60 million pixels, so you can do wall slide images with it. And launched into taking this digital, this wonderful digital Hasselblad, ar again around the world into wonderful places, wild places, um, where the ecosystems are still intact. Here in Botswana, this elephant was just ready to reach out with me with his trunk. I think the guy did think that was a good idea, and he just made a, a quiet slap on the side of the, uh, of the Toyota, and uh, he walked, he, he ambled away. Um, but also into the national parks, uh, the Arctic, Alaska, um, into tropical environments, Svalbard in the Arctic. Uh, I found a underwater housing for this camera on the internet that was made in Czechoslovakia, of all places. And um, had launched into my new career, which was 2011. 
And um, a new thing happened, which was great. Uh, back to Smithsonian, making a pitch for the third exhibit. And this time on Iceland, and another wonderful adventure. Uh, and Iceland personifies everything that I love, because unlike much of the world, when you're in Iceland, you know that nature is very much in charge. And I really do believe that that new characterization of where we are in the world and in civilization is that we are in the Anthropocene era, where actually man is in charge of our destiny. That's, that, may also, may, that may be a hopeful sign, but it's also one that's a little bit scary because the wonderful reservoir of diversity that exists in nature is really threatened. Uh, but if you're in Iceland, you know that nature is in charge. Here you see me with a gyro, Hasselblad for a uh, most productive helicopter ride that I've probably ever taken in my life. Those big balls on the bottom are actually gyros. And you'll see that I'm looking a little bit under the weather. I had a ride at 9 o'clock at the helicopter the night before, and I was really wondering uh, whether I would be able to carry on, but somehow uh, it all worked, and it was the most productive day of uh, photography I've ever had in my life. And as you can see, some of the roads in Iceland are more like rivers, and uh, some of these signs get your attention. And I told my guide that maybe I would not be getting back, uh, we wouldn't be getting back to the hotel that night. Fortunately, a large uh, alpine vehicle that went up to the glaciers was behind us later in the day and uh, pulled us out. It was those ephemeral moments that I always found so precious uh, for uh, photography. And so I told my guide at this particular spot, which ended up being the cover of our book, that if we waited, the light would come right, and true enough, in two hours, it did. I returned to Iceland actually nine times. Why would you go back to a place nine times? Um, basically, um, every season and every month in Iceland is different. And what you notice so much is the changes in the light. Here I was so excited about getting something that I, I, I put the boots on the wrong feet. And um, but and then finally what was missing from our Iceland exhibit, and we didn't know whether we were going to have the opportunity for it to happen, was a volcanic eruption. And you know, it's a land of fire and ice, right? And uh, the man I collaborated with, wonderful man who's not only a poet but a geophysicist, said, um, well, Bill, your chances of getting that are 50-50 before the exhibit opens. But through a long summer of watching the seismic maps and everything, it happened on September 2nd, a long, adventuresome helicopter trip with the uh, pulling a fuel, the uh, a fuel truck uh, out there too so, that th so we could get back uh, to Reykjavik on the helicopter. Through dust, through rainstorms, we had uh, a day out with a flowing volcano. Here we're standing about 15 feet from flowing lava that I will never forget. Just the power of nature, being in a place like this, being with a geophysicist that actually understands what's happening. I mean, this was the key to my doing anything. I'm not going to dive in the water with sperm whales without somebody that knows sperm whales. I'm not going to go out to a volcanic eruption without someone that knows. It. So it was a little bit like the Apollo landing when we came in to the uh, 
RE was saying, no, it's not safe to land there. Move over a little bit, land over there. And, but it all worked, and it was a fabulous day. But I can't tell you how, wh what, an, um, what, uh, what a mind-blowing experience it is to be in these big landscapes um, and experience them. Finally culminating in our exhibit, our last exhibit, which is still open in uh, Washington. And um, what we did again was uh, a new technology where the prints were actually printed on, there's a, a coating that is placed on Aluma metal. And, um, and they have, um, a striking luminescence that uh, I've never seen before. It's a, it's a new technology. And again, the team. This is both the uh, Iceland team, the Smithsonian team, and our team, some of the folks I already introduced. And uh, you know, the really wonderful thing again about this is no big ego. No big ego. Everybody worked cooperatively together which made it so great. The opening night with Ari, the poet and the geophysicist. And again, I always think that dreams are so important, but before a big meet, our first big meeting with Smithsonian, I dreamt that what the hall could really benefit was from, was a soundscape. And actually that wasn't even on the agenda, but I had the brought it up, put it out there, and um, it didn't seem like it was going to fly at first, but by the time it all developed, it really worked, and uh, better still, a creative lady on the, um, on the Smithsonian team, Virginia, actually created this aurora. It's a moving aurora which floats over the exhibit, and um, it's a real privilege to be there. Uh, with uh, seven million visitors a year and being open for almost two years. And now uh, the encouraging news that we have is that it's now maybe going to become a traveling exhibit. So again, demonstrating the technology of the camera. This, is, this picture is 196 inches and uh, you can just see the, the level of detail with these new uh, with this new digital technology, a book, which was wonderfully rewarding, which accompanied the exhibit, and a team in China, which was just as passionate about producing quality as, uh, as, our, as our local and Iceland, Icelandic team. So now um, I'm showing you some images from Iceland exhibit in the book. And just such an, an amazing diversity. Then in March, in uh, October, you have the bonus of the wonderful auroras. And you wonder how people that came to Iceland survived through these long winters and developed this literary tradition with all the hardships that they that they uh, put up in this Arctic environment. We had a wonderful helicopter pilot. He was kind of a hot dog pilot. You, you could, and you could appreciate that, Ron. And um, but the best thing is that he intuitively understood a photographer's needs, and uh, with just little fine tuning over the intercom, he would just get it perfectly placed, and um, just makes such a huge difference. And explains why this was one of my more productive days. ABC came back here in December before this huge 
flow was over, they didn't get anywhere close to this volcano. They had drones that flew in, but they made it sound like they were the, they were the first guys to get here. <laughs> and now, uh, finally, uh, a new opportunity has come to me, and that is in healthcare facilities and uh, the developing science, because hospitals and places where you get cancer treatment, whatever, these are not fun places to be. And there's a growing awa awareness, again, of bringing, bringing nature into these places and what a difference it can make to these environments. So we, we see this as a wonderful new direction to go in. This is the, this is some images that we have at the Cancer Treatment Centers of, of America, which is a national organization. And um, of course, it's really always wise to get along well with the ladies committees. And because they're the movers and shakers, they really are. And um, this is Abington Hospital, which um, we have some Oswamp in the room and you can't really mention uh, Abington Hospital without thinking about um, what Carl uh, Sr. did in getting, uh, in getting this hospital started. And uh, I'm so privileged that we were able to do all the corridors and change the interior environment of this place. And, but again, thinking about where we are, a new church, a new church perspective. It was interesting that Ansel Adams, one of my heroes, said, "Art is both the taking and the giving of beauty, the turning out to the light, the inner fold of the awareness of the spirit. It is the recreation on another plane." of the realities of the world, the tragic and wonderful realities of earth and men, and of all the interrelations of these. And of course, from our perspective in the new church, we know that there is a spiritual man, and that's really what our lives are all about. And. Um, there are uh, numerous references to nature um, in the writings of Emanuel Swedenborg that, that say that nature is really a, um, a theater for the spiritual world. And so um, I do try to keep that in mind that when I am taking these images, that um, I really, uh, so something that can really move uh, has to be something that somehow resonates with the human spirit because we do indeed have inner, inner landscapes. Um, so this is some of my recent work doing it in a lot of different environments. And my brother, the prophet. Wilderness in California. Death Valley. Delaware Bay, one of those amazing, amazing phenomena where all the horseshoes come to be, come to prove where the red knots that are migrating to the Arctic, the local environments, Glacier National Park, which won't even be a Glacier National Park 20 years from now, sadly. Svalbard, Greenland, Honeypack, the Smokies, South Carolina, the 
endangered polar bears, our national parks out in Utah, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and then ending up on a note of hope that although we fought for with Bucks County for 20 years trying to get this bike path in, uh, where they fought us tooth and nail, it's happened. And now they are open to extending that all the way to New Penn. So my friend Art Logan at the County Plan Planning Commission, he, he said government is what I call the three Ds. Defer, delay, defeat. But you know what? Never lose your hope. And here I am in a beehive living in a Toll Brothers facility. And when I open my curtains in the morning, this is what I see. It's a bald eagle. Amazing. Uh, when Kirsten passed away, of course, um, I did make some changes. I had remembered how much I enjoyed ping pong. And so over the objections of my interior decorator, this is in my living room. And I'm going to play Carly in just about a week from now. And um, any of you, I was thinking if there's any students here, please, if you have any spare time, please come on and, and play with me. Thank you very much. audience. Well, I kept you way over time, so you, you want a Q&A? I'll keep it short. Anybody wants to leave, please leave. Yes, Leo. Yes, uh, well, uh, you know, we do have a presidential candidate that thinks that burning more coal is a good idea, but anybody that has been out around to the Arctic and sees how much these glaciers have receded in a very, very short time. We just experienced the two hottest day in the history of the world since they've been keeping temperatures. And the truth is there will not be any glaciers in Glacier National Park 20 years from now. It, it's just it's just a fact. I was wondering if you were conservation oh. uh, in your conservation efforts, I noticed that the Sierra Club came up in one of your photographs. And I was wondering if you could maybe speak to some of your experiences changing public opinion with the Sierra Club. Yes. Well, you know, uh, that book, of course, in, in, in Wildness is the Preservation of the World, was a stunning book. But um, my uh, conservation experience has been more, I was uh, back in the day that Silent Spring came out. Uh, the, I was uh, privileged to be on the board of the Environmental Defense Fund. and. You might recall that they got started actually uh, because they were really concerned what was happening to the osprey population in uh, Long Island with DEP. And, um, and um, so uh, I did get to serve on their executive committee uh, for a short while. My longest stint was uh, on the Ocean Conservancy. Ocean Conservancy bounces their directors off their board uh, every um, three years. So I had um, four returns to that organization. And of course, 
with all my experiences in the ocean, three or four months in the ocean, I could, I think I could provide the board with a, with a, a, sw a pr uh, perspective that uh, that they would not have had otherwise. And as I had mentioned, I, I just think it's fascinating that uh, you know acidification of the ocean was not on the on the radar screen. And I think you know that acidification of the ocean is happening because carbon dioxide is being absorbed in the ocean. And, um, and um, having had a 150-gallon aquarium in my Neutra house, I have a lot of appreciation how, how quickly something can change when you change the pH because I've, I've seen that pH explosion in my aquarium and trying to drop a lot of bio phosphate into the aquarium to, to get it back to a pH 7, uh, you know, is not an easy task. Anyone else? Thanks again. Thank you, Phil.